Good morning, everyone. Um, we're continuing in Judges. <laughs> um, and uh, we're up to chapter 14. Uh, I think last time we s- I spoke, we were introduced to Samson and his miraculous uh, birth, where his parents had been barren uh, and childless, and then the angel of the Lord turns up and um, tells Samson's mum that she's going to give birth, and Samson is going to be um, dedicated as a Nazarite from birth. So uh, we're up to chapter 14. Um, So I'll pray and then we'll uh, begin. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that um, through everything that's written in your word, we can learn. Father, thank you that sometimes we have to wrestle with your word. Thank you that it is, uh, has so many layers, that it is beyond um, figuring out completely. <laughs> Father, but thank you that you provide your Holy Spirit to give us uh, the way to understand it, to apply it to our lives, to let it change our hearts and let it... Um, yeah, thank you. That the, yeah, your Holy Spirit, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we can let it wash us, change us, uh, encourage us and empower us. And uh, yeah, as we look at the story of Samson, I pray that your spirit would just speak to each of us, um, to, straight to our hearts and just maybe convict us, uh, encourage us, uh, guide us and lead us uh, in the way that we should go. And I pray that you would anoint the words that uh, are spoken this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, yeah, Samson has been uh, set apart as a Nazarite. Um, so this was a special uh, calling. Um, and there were some uh, limitations or some strict rules about being set apart as a Nazarite for the Lord. Um, And so, we'll just start from chapter 13, verse 24, just to finish off uh, the last chapter again. If you can get that on the screen, I don't think, is it on the screen? Ah, there we go. So it says, "When when her son was born, she named him Samson, and the Lord blessed him as he grew up. And none of the other judges uh, does it say that the Lord blessed, but Samson was blessed uh, as he grew up, and so he's had a wonderful childhood, God's blessed him with, well it doesn't say what, but the Lord's blessing is good, <laughs> we all want that, don't we, we all want that for our children as they grow up, uh, and the Lord has blessed him, and then verse 25, it says, the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he lived in Mahana Dan, which is located between the towns of Zorah and Eshtal. So um, the Lord's doing a work in Samson. Uh, It doesn't say what exactly he's stirring in him, but um, sometimes, you know, the the Lord stirs us up, doesn't he? He kind of puts an ache in our hearts or a desire or a passion. Um, Some people think that it's because his tribe of Dan didn't have a, hadn't actually taken possession of the land um, it was still, the, the land allotted to them was still under the control of their enemies. Uh, and maybe this riled Samson. Maybe he wanted, you know, he felt that he, something needed to be done to, so that his tribe could actually have a permanent home um, and the enemies of God could be defeated. Um, yeah. But then, the last verse in chapter 13, you're like excited that the Lord is stirring something in Samson. He's been blessed as he's growing up. And then let's go to the first verse of chapter 14 and see what it says. <laughs> and uh, it says, one day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. And you're just like, what's happened? God's blessed him as he's growing up. He's stirring, his spirit is stirring something up in him. And then one of the Philistine women catches his eye. And that is a warning to all of us, really, isn't it? That God can stir us, God can bless us, and yet we are not 
immune to the flesh. Uh, Our eyes, sometimes what we see, and in this case with Samson, it was a a woman that the Israelites were forbidden to um, marry. Let's go to uh, Exodus 34. If you can go to Exodus 34, verse 15. Uh, God couldn't be clearer about this. It says, you must not make a treaty of any kind with the people living in the land. They lust after their gods, offering sacrifices to them. They will invite you to join them in their sacrificial meals, and you will go with them. Uh, Verse 16. Then you will accept their daughters who sacrifice to other gods as wives for your sons, and they will seduce your sons to commit adultery against me by worshipping other gods. So God was very clear don't allow your sons to uh, marry the daughters of the enemies of Israel. And then this is repeated again in Deuteronomy. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 to 4. And this one's quite interesting. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you're about to enter and occupy, he will clear away many nations ahead of you, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them, make no treaties with them, and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not, do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and you will quit and will quickly destroy you. you, Next verse. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars, cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols. And it's interesting there that it says that they will destroy you and it talks about shattering their sacred pillars. And obviously if you've read the story of Samson, you know how it ends. Uh, And that verse 5 there, is what happens. The sacred pillars are destroyed by Samson, but ultimately Samson is destroyed as well. Um, So God's made it very clear that Samson shouldn't be uh, going after Philistine women. So let's go back to chapter 14. What uh, what does Samson do in response to um, having his eyes caught by this Philistine woman. He says, when he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. (laughs) You know, he's not, uh, he doesn't do it gently, does he? He doesn't do it politely. He just acts like a spoilt uh, child, doesn't he? Uh, And maybe he was spoilt. You know, when parents know that there's something special about their children, they can sometimes... Uh, spoil them and indulge indulge them and they end up becoming almost like spoiled brats don't they and he just says I want it caught my eye I want to marry her get her for me and how do the, her, his parents respond they respond with the right answer but um, well let's read it it says his father and mother objected isn't there even one woman in, in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry they asked Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. And instead of responding with, no, the Lord has forbidden this, they start to go, surely there must be someone in Israel who you could marry instead. You know, they should have probably, as we've just looked in Exodus and Deuteronomy, gone, no, God clearly forbidden this. This is what will happen you'll be destroyed, you'll be led astray, it's not going to be good, don't do it. But instead, they kind of just use a kind of almost a human argument going, come on, there must be someone you can marry. And obviously, he's going to say, well, no, there isn't. So then their argument is defeated. Often, we use our own arguments, don't we, to kind of um, advise people against something. But actually, the best place to go to is God's word, because you can't argue with God's word. (laughs) You know, they've said... There must be someone else. There must be plenty of other fishes in the sea. No, don't use our own human wisdom. Go to the wisdom of God because, you know, the enemy has, what, millennia of experience on how to fight battles and 
um, fight God's, God's people and fight God. We, if we live long enough, have about, what, 100 years, maybe 120 if we're really uh, lucky. Most of us possibly 70 or 80 years to live. And in that time, we can't get the wisdom needed to fight the enemy on our own. Hence why God has given us his word. And when we stand on that and use that to defeat um, anything that comes in to destroy maybe our family, our children. In this case, it was Samson, their child, going off track. And his parents should have brought him back to the word of God and said no. But instead, they just used their own wisdom. Um, can, let's carry on. His, well, actually, no, let's go back. Um, interesting, when his mum and dad object, what does he then do? Who does he then speak to? He says, but Samson told his father. Now, I don't know if, you, if your parents, you'll know that your children are very good at working out who they are more likely to get their way with. Uh, and sometimes that's the mum. Sometimes that's the dad. And I think in this case, as we saw in the previous chapter, Samson's dad isn't necessarily the sharpest knife in the drawer. You know, he has to be reminded by his wife that God's not going to kill us because we're going to have a child. And so maybe he thinks that actually I'll separate them here. I'll go to my dad separately and convince him. And it looks like he is um, successful. So... We, I mean, as children, I'm sure we've all done that, tried to go to the parent that we think will give us the answer that we want or is more easily convinced or is maybe uh, the weaker <laughs> in terms of God's wisdom. And uh, yeah, it seems to be what he does there. And so as parents, it's vital that we are on the same page with one another and that actually we go back to God's word, not our own human wisdom, uh, because that doesn't work. So... His father and mother didn't realize. Now, this is really interesting. The, um, the Lord was at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines who ruled over Israel at the time. And you kind of think, what? God is working in this situation where Samson's disobeying the Lord. How does that work? And that doesn't say that we should disobey the Lord because God uses it to work. I think what this shows is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign over everything, including our sin. And like it says in the Bible, it doesn't say, well, if, God's, you know, if God is sovereign, then we should just do what we want. No, we shouldn't. We should obey God. But we've also got to realize that God is sovereign over everything. And uh, that should be an encouragement to us, an encouragement to trust God, um, because he works through us, even through our... Uh, folly and our sin, God can work uh, good and does. Uh, but again, that doesn't excuse or, you know, ultimately, if we follow God, if we follow his will, if we wait for his timing, that's the best way to uh, live our lives. And Samson's life was a very tragic one as well, and it could have been so much greater but even through Samson's folly, Samson's sin, God is sovereign. Um, yeah. So, verse 17. Sorry, not, not verse 17. Where were we? Uh, verse 5. As Samson and his parents, so basically he's convinced them, he's got them in his pocket, and they're off okay, <laughs> to find, to marry this woman. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timna, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timna. Let's keep going. At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat, but he didn't tell his father or mother about it. So let's just uh, look at these two verses, what's going on there. Um, first of all, I think often, you know, Timna was Philistine territory. Samson's wandering off the course that God's called him to. He's got his mother and father in his pocket there along with him. And all of a sudden this lion comes to try and take his life. And when we wander outside of God's will, often the enemy kind of has us, doesn't he? And can, we wander into enemy territory when we shouldn't be. You know, when God has clearly forbidden us. 
we, put ourselves, we make ourselves vulnerable to attack from the enemy. But God's gracious, God's patient, and it says that he's, his spirit came upon Samson so that he could just rip, rip this lion apart. This isn't God necessarily confirming and approving of Samson's actions, but it's God's grace, isn't it? And we all need God's grace because we've all rebelled against God. We've all uh, turned against, turned away from his work, his path. And so God's grace is upon Samson's life. Um, and God saves him from this lion. And he says that he teared him apart as easy as a goat. Now, I I've never t t torn a goat apart, uh, but apparently it's easy. Um, but yeah, he tears this lion apart as easily as a young goat. Now, but then it says, but he didn't tell his father or mother about it. And right from the start of Samson's story, we see that people are keeping secrets or not telling each other the truth. And this is where it starts, doesn't it? Why did he not tell his father and mother about this lion? Because I'd be like, mom and dad, I've just ripped a lion apart. And I'm, I'm thinking... If we look, where does the lion attack him? If we go back to verse 5, near the vineyards of Timnah. And if we can go back to, uh, where is it, Numbers 6. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to read about the Nazarite vow uh, that Samson was part of. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, either men or women, take the special vow of a Nazarite, setting themselves apart to the Lord in a special way, they must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. They must not use vinegar made from wine or from other alcoholic drinks. They must not drink fresh grape juice. They must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound by the Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from a grapevine not even the grape seeds or skins. They must never cut their hair throughout the time of their vow, for they are holy and set apart to the Lord. Until the time of their vow has been fulfilled, they must let their hair grow long. And they must not go near a dead body during the entire period of their vow to the Lord. Even if the dead person is their own father, mother, brother, or sister, they must not defile themselves, for the hair on their head is the symbol of their separation to God. The, this requirement applies as long as they are set apart to the Lord. So, those are the details of the Nazarite vow. And where was Samson attacked? Near the vineyard. What, are, what is there in the vineyard? Grapes, grape juice, wine, seeds, all the things that he's not allowed to touch. So, the implication there is, well, why would you leave your mother and father on a journey something major happen and you rip it apart a line and then not tell your mum and dad. And it's like, well, actually, he probably didn't tell them because as much as he probably wanted to boast, because Samson was a boaster about how he'd ripped apart a line, if he boasted about a line, they'd be like, well, why were you down there? And then the penny drops, doesn't it? You know, I, if you've got kids, sometimes they might not tell you something that's good because it will reveal that they were actually doing something bad at the time. And so they kind of work out, I'm probably better off not saying this and Samson has already disobeyed the commandment of trying to, you know marrying a, a non-israelite woman uh, a Canaanite woman and now he's broken the first of his Nazarite vows which was to not touch anything from the vineyard and again when we wander off course you know this path that he's on when we wander off course we make ourselves vulnerable to the enemy's attack. Um, so he didn't tell his mother and father about it. If we can go back to verse 7 of Judges 14. When Samson arrived in Timnah, he talked with the woman and was very pleased with her. When we, want, when we you know, when the enemy uh, tries to distract us, often the words will be pleasing to our ears. You know, the enemy will... Um, try and catch us with, the eye, the, with our senses, with our eyes. He'll be pleasing uh, with our ears. He'll try and convince us. Um, and then 
with the taste. If we look at Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, what happens? Eve sees the fruit and sees it with her eye, decides it's good, and takes it and eats it, and then listens to the enemy, and then shares it with her husband, and her husband uh, doesn't do anything about it. So he's very pleased with the woman. Verse 8 it says, Later, when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, he turned off the path. And we can sometimes turn off the path, can't we, in life? Because we've got a part of our life that we've not surrendered or we're walking in rebellion or we're disobeying God's word. And the next Nazarite vow is broken. He turned off the path to look at the carcass of the lion. A carcass is a dead body. And he's not allowed to go near or touch a dead body. So what does he do? He doesn't just touch the dead body. He found that a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. And, he, and instead of just going, oh, well, that's okay, he scoops it up. He scoops some of the honey into his hands and ate it along the way. He also gave some to his father and mother, and they ate it. Again, secrecy, but he didn't tell them he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. Why? Because that's the second point of the Nazarite vow, that he is broken. And, you know, it would, he, he would be in trouble from his parents. He'd, it would, they would just be heartbroken. They would be so angry. And yet God knows. God knows what he's done. Um, so then verse 10, it says, As his father was making final arrangements for the marriage, Samson threw a party at Timnah, as was the custom for elite young men. When the bride's parents saw him, they selected 30 young men from the town to be his companions. I find that quite sad in a way, isn't it? Like Samson was a loner. He didn't really ever do anything uh, by himself. He probably had lots of issues. I think if we were kind of in modern days, he'd probably be classed as a psychopath and just a crazy guy. Um, and his life is so sad that his in-laws have to kind of provide friends for him and it's just yeah it's really sad and when when we go off track with God we can often end up becoming alone so and clearly he doesn't value these people he just uses them so verse 12 it says Samson said to them let me tell you a riddle if you solve my riddle during these seven days of the celebration I will give you 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. But if you can't solve it, then you must give me 35, 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. So he likes to wind people up. He likes to kind of have bets. He likes to have secrets. And so he's got this riddle. And they agree. All right, they agreed. Let's hear your riddle. So he said, out of the one who eats come, came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Three days later, they were still trying to figure it out. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to explain the riddle for us, or we will burn down your father's house with you in it. So these, you know, these people don't mess around. You know, when you, and God knows that this sort of thing happens, doesn't it? He, he's married this woman. The woman's pleasing to his eye, but he's also ended up with all these people that are very violent and, yeah, threatening his wife with being burnt down. It's like there's a reason God said don't mix with these people. And yet this is what happens. So now they're threatening her uh, with, with kind of murder. Uh, we'll burn down your father's house with you in it. Did you invite us to this party just to make us poor? So what can she do? She's in a very difficult position. She's, so she resorts to manipulation. So Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, you don't love me, you hate me, you have given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. So he then says, I haven't even given the answer to my mother, father or mother, he replied. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. Then she explained the riddle to the young men. 
So before sunset of the seventh day, the men of the town came to Samson with their answer. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson replied, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. Very rude. He's just called his wife, his, his brand new bride, a, a cow. What, you know, what kind of guy is he? Clearly, uh, this isn't him living the way God wanted him to live. Um, and it says then, and then this is the weird thing. It says, then the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. I've, that has never happened to me. I've never called my wife a cow. And even if, I, even if I did, I don't think the next thing that would happen to me would be that the Holy Spirit would come in power. And then it says he went down to the town of Ashkelon, killed 30 men, took their belongings, and gave their clothing to the men who had solved his riddle. But Samson was furious about what had happened. And he went back home to live with his father and mother. So his wife was given in marriage to the man who had been Samson's best man at the wedding. And, you know, the Holy Spirit can come upon us. And the reason the Holy Spirit comes upon us is so that we can build up the church. We can build up one another. We can um, basically carry out God's will. You know, Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit. He did nothing with that that without the power of the Holy Spirit and God leading him. He did everything that was in the Father's will. He didn't do anything in his own will. But here, Samson receives the Holy Spirit, but then does his own will, doesn't he? Kills 30 men, uses his strengths rather than for his own good, in his own purpose, in his own selfish intent, uh, rather than what God wanted him to use it for. And... How does it end? How does this chapter end? It says he went back home to live with his father and mother and his wife was given to someone else. And I think, you know, the carcass with the honey in it is a kind of symbolizes what it's like when we chase after the things that the, the enemy tries to entice us with. You know, it might be pleasant to our eyes, it might be sweet to our lips. It might um, appear to have everything wonderful, but actually it's within death, if that makes sense. You know, the devil counterfeits what God gives. You know, the Israelites were given um, the land of, the promised land, as a land flowing with milk and honey. But the devil here is giving me honey but it's inside a body of death. And you can see that it doesn't end well, does it? It starts off lovely, this beautiful woman who catches his eye, he goes off, takes his parent along, talks to her, she sounds great, says all the right things, he's pleased with what she says, but then it finishes with him calling her a cow, murdering 30 of her people, going back home to live with his father and mother, and his wife being given to the best man. And so, when we, when we follow God, sometimes it might cause, a, you know, God doesn't promise us happiness and, and prosperity and wealth and all the blessings in the way that we expect. When we follow God and his obedience, we have to often deny ourselves, doesn't it? Jesus says, we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And, but instead, when we indulge ourselves, we end up in a terrible situation. We end up with nothing. He, he's alone. He's no wife. He's gone back to live with his father and mother. Um, and his wife's been given away. But when we follow God, and Samson could have followed God and obeyed God, um, it might be tough. It might require us to deny ourselves. But ultimately, we will end up with the blessings of God that are far greater than anything the world can offer. Um, but yeah, the devil will tell you what you want. He'll show you what you want and give you what you want if he can have your soul. And God isn't like that. He's the very opposite. He will tell you sometimes things you don't want to hear. He will, um, yeah, sometimes he'd rather you go through some tough times so that he can prepare you for what God has for you and you know this 
This time as he was growing up, God was preparing him, but he got distracted and gave in to his flesh. Um, let me just finish. And so he's broken God's law by marrying a Canaanite woman. He has then not only touched a dead body, but eaten from the food from within a dead body. He's eaten. It's pretty obvious he's had some grapes or wine or something. Um, and so the only thing left is for his hair to be cut, uh, which he hasn't allowed to be happen yet, which is good. Um, I don't know whether we've got time. Let's uh, go to the next chapter. I wasn't sure I was going to do the next chapter, but let's see what happens. So for chapter 15, it says, Later on, during the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat as a present to his wife. So he's had a bit of time to um, kind of get over his anger and the, uh, the events of the, his kind of marriage celebration. And so now he's thinking, right, well, I called her a cow. She's probably going to be... Uh, cross with me uh, so I'll take her a gift and hopefully everything will be all right you know I'm sure we've all had that haven't we wives when your husband bring you a gift you're like oh right what's this uh, you know to say sorry and make up um, so he said I'm going to going into my wife's room to sleep with her but her father wouldn't let him in not surprised I truly thought you must hate her her father explained so I gave her in marriage to your best man but look, her younger sister is even more beautiful than she is. Marry her instead. And this, you know, the, the way the women were treated there were like just objects, just, oh, you can have this one. Um, and that's not how God intends us to treat one another. But it was the way that the Philistines treated women. Samson said, this time I cannot be blamed for everything I am going to do to you, Philistines. Then he went out and caught, and this story is just crazy. <laughs> caught 300 foxes now I don't know how difficult it is to catch a fox but I'm pretty certain it's very difficult to catch 300 foxes um, would have taken a long time most people when they're angry they calm down eventually after a short while they might be angry for you know hours maybe but they don't they're not angry for the time it takes to catch 300 foxes then he does something very cruel. He tied their tails together in pairs and he fastened a torch to each pair of tails. Then he lit the torches and let the foxes run through the grain fields of the Philistines. This is just <laughs> pure evil, isn't it? Just not only to the foxes, but then to destroy all their food. The grain fields of the Philistines. He burned all their grain to the ground, including the sheaves and the uncut grain. He also destroyed their vineyards and olive groves and surprisingly they wanted to know who did this the Philistines demanded uh, and everyone obviously knew it was Samson was the reply because his father-in-law from Timna gave Samson's wife to be married to his best man and so you think right they're gonna be really angry with Samson so what did they do so the Philistines went and got the woman and her father and burned them to death Clearly, that's not the person that you should be punishing. It's Samson. And so, you know, their sense of justice was not right, was it? They just destroyed the, the victims of this um, instead of the perpetrator. So Samson, um, because you did this, Samson vowed, I won't rest until I take my revenge on you. So he attacked the Philistines with great fury and killed many of them. Then he went to live in a cave in the rock of Etam. So at the end of the first events, he goes home and lives with his mum and dad. Now it's descended into the fact that he's going to live in a cave. Maybe he's not even welcome at home. You know, maybe his parents, you know, his parents might have said, well, if you're going off, don't come back to us. And so he ends up in a cave. And we see this downward spiral of Samson's life. And obviously, retaliation and revenge it says, verse 9, the Philistines retaliated by setting up camp in Judah and spreading out near the town of Lehi. The men of Judah asked the Philistines, why are you attacking us? The Philistines replied, we've come to capture Samson. We've come to pay him back for what he did to us. And so Samson's actions aren't just falling back on him now. They're falling back on the Israelites 
and they're getting caught up in Samson's mess. And so they didn't want anything to do with this. So 3,000 3, men of Judah went down to get Samson at the cave in the Rock of Etam. I don't understand that because how... There's only so many men that can actually help capture Samson, aren't there? Because you can't get 3,000 people round one man. But clearly, they felt they needed 3,000 men. Uh, Don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? But Samson replied, I only did to them what they did to me. If, you know, if... (laughs) How old do you think he is? That's the talk of like a... A young child, isn't it, who's, um, who's being told off for being mean to his brother or sister. Um, but the men of Judah told him, we have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. So they've had enough of him. He's causing trouble. And they just want to be rid of him and like, well, have, take Samson and leave us alone. And what does Samson say? He says, all right, Samson said, but promise that you won't kill me yourselves. We will only tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines, they replied. We won't kill you. So they tied him up with new ropes and brought him up from the rock. As Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph. But the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. Then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. He picked it up and killed a thousand Philistines with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. When he finished boasting, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. And, you know, God gave him this victory. It wasn't Samson, but what does Samson say? I've killed them. If we see in other judges, you know, there was the song of Deborah, uh, how they gave glory and honor to God. Samson doesn't do that. He claims the victory for himself and claims that it was his own strength. And then it says in verse 18, Samson was now very thirsty. (laughs) So he's now thirsty. You know, it's all about the flesh, isn't it? Samson was now very thirsty and he cried out to the Lord, you have accomplished this great victory by the strength of your servant." By the strength of your servant. So it's like, I've won this victory for you, God. When really it was the other way around, wasn't it? Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of these pagans? Again, here's God's grace. So God caused water to gush out of a hollow in the ground at Lehi. And Samson was revived as he drank. Then he named that place the spring of the one who cried out. You know, he names it after himself rather than going, you know, the, the place where God provided. The other people, you know, heroes of the faith used to name places after what God did, not what he did. And then it says, Samson judged Israel for 20 years during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. I won't go into chapter 17 because that's the uh, con- kind of conclusion of uh, Samson's life. But he very much lived in the flesh rather than living by the Spirit. And we see the destruction that follows, the, the death and the deaths that follow, the boasting, the, pr- the pr- uh, pride, um, and just the devastation. But through it all, and as we'll read in the next chapter next time, we see God's, ha- God's sovereign uh, power to um, save his people um, despite Samson's flaws Um, and what we see later on is that when Samson stops relying on his own strength and when he's got nothing left that that's when he finally turns to the Lord and that's when the Lord wins the biggest victory Um, and you know when we we can rely on our strengths we can rely on our strengths but actually God wants us to rely on him we can, when we rely on our strengths, we often use it to uh, indulge our flesh or kind of go along with the desires of our flesh. But when we rely on God and, use, and his strength, then we're guided by him and we avoid all the heartache, the trouble, uh, and the pain that comes through that. Um, and 
Where is it? It talks, you know, where it talks about how how Samson um, will begin to save his people. If we go to Matthew chapter one, verse twenty-one, it talks about Jesus. So, and you know, so this is the angel. Uh, or I think it's actually Joseph, isn't it, in his dream, and it says, she will have a son, yeah, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so where it says that Samson begins to save um, his people, Jesus is the one who completes it, and on the cross, he says, it is finished. Um, We know that Samson doesn't save the Israelites completely from the Philistines because we know that the story of David and Goliath, one of the most, probably the most famous Philistine, uh, follows Judges. And so he doesn't uh, completely defeat Israel's enemies, but he starts something, God uses him. But ultimately it foreshadows Jesus who lived the completely opposite life to Samson, doesn't he? He, he had a miraculous birth, but this time it wasn't uh, of a human father it was God himself who was his father and he didn't live by the flesh he lived through the power of the Holy Spirit he lived a, sin, a sinless life um, and then was able to completely save his people from their sins and he willingly gave his life um, Samson actually was captured by his enemies when the Lord left him because eventually God ran out of patience with Samson and, set, and just left him because he'd completely uh, disregarded every promise and every vow and every law that God had given him. And so we can learn a lot from Samson's life. Don't be like him. <laughs> um, but we can also be encouraged that if we have messed up in the past, if we have uh, rejected God, if we've gone our own way, if we've done things... Um, that weren't what God wanted us to do, God can still use us. He's not, your sin is not bigger than God. God is sovereign over everything, including our sin. And so when we come to God and we repent, he can still, um, he can still work through our lives to achieve his purposes. And we'll see that next time in the, uh, in chapter 16 of um, judges so that's what I want to leave with that yes don't be like Samson follow after God but if we have been like Samson God is bigger than anything we've ever done and nothing shall separate us from his love Um, and there we go thank you